Hey, do you know how I get private access to the open internet? With a VPN, of course, but not just any VPN. I use Surfshark. With Surfshark, I eliminated problems like ad manipulation, price discrimination whenever I purchase online, identity theft, and tracking in general. I can also access streaming platforms like Netflix, Disney+, Prime Video, and many others from anywhere in the world. Last time I was in the US, some of my favorite series magically became available because I connected to UK with Surfshark. Surfshark encrypts all the internet traffic sent to and from all my devices, and it hides my IP address so nobody can see what I do online. And all that with one simple click. If you use coupon code data science, you get 83% off for a two years plan and three additional months for free. That makes 27 months for less than $60 or 50 euros. So get Surfshark at surfshark.deals slash data science and protect your privacy now. Check the show notes of this episode at datascienceatom.com and get your coupon code for free. All right, let's do this. How are you data scientists and engineers? How are you business people? What's up nerds? Did you grasp that thing you were studying? This is Data Science at Home, the podcast about machine learning, artificial intelligence, and more good stuff. I am Francesco, I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes, so grab a cup of coffee and join me as we learn more about the topics we love most. Hey, 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 welcome back to another episode of Data Science at Home. I'm Francesco, I'll be your host for 20, 30 minutes maybe. Today it's gonna be short and clear. I'm going to speak about unbalanced data, in fact, very unbalanced data, and uh, uh, some mitigations, of course, that are uh, that, that people out there know, maybe, maybe not, well, uh, we'll see. I'm going to make sure this episode is going to be kind of self-contained, though the literature is extremely rich when it comes to bias and unbalanced data, and also some of the mitigations that uh, are already in place if you're a data scientist. Uh, libraries that you can use out there. I'll try to put some in the show notes of this episode at the official website, datasenseatome.com, of course. Now, what is unbalanced data? For whoever out there, are still people who don't know what unbalanced data is, actually? I'm not really sure, but anyway. Unbalanced data is data that is unbalanced. (laughs) Just kidding. It's just data that, um, for example, you have positive and negative samples. Think about um, the the data set of an hospital in which you are uh, tracking people with a certain disease. You have, of course, those who are positive to such disease and those who are negative. And so you have collected a series of medical tasks and what you have is a bunch of positive and and, uh, and negative um, uh, samples, right? Now, for many diseases out there, Um, it is very normal, very common to have very few positive cases and so many negative cases. And to be honest with you, thank God that's the case because, you know, it means that the disease is kind of rare, not so many people get it, and so not so many people probably die because of that particular disease. But you can think of this across sectors. Think about fraud in uh, in financial financial crime, for example. Uh, Another good thing to have um, you know, very few samples out there with respect to the negative ones. So negative means um, transactions that are not considered fraudulent transactions, while the positive ones are those that indeed should be stopped or tracked or reported to, to the authorities, right? So that's usually, um, um, you know, the number of these positive samples are usually very low. So the problem is, so, so that's a good thing for, for you know, <laughs> for the real world perspective, but for a machine learning model, this is a very bad thing because uh, you, you know, your model is going to be, you know, trained on a very tiny fraction of positive cases. And so the internal parameters that you are trying to, you know, descend with a gradient or learn in general, these internal parameters can be so many that you don't have enough data to, to train these, uh, these parameters appropriately. And so that's a problem. Um, another big problem is that if your model doesn't know that is in front of a very unbalanced data, uh, well, it can give you very misleading results. Think about a model that always says, 
you know, 99% of the time says, no, it's the, this patient is say is, is healthy or no, this financial transaction is not fraudulent transaction. So you just have a model that says no all the time. Well, when you are facing, when you put this model in production in front of data that are always no, and sometimes it's a yes, well, that model is going to be right 99% of the time, right? Which is extremely wrong because, you know, you will never get the, the fraudulent transactions or the unhealthy patients. And so there are several techniques when it comes to unbalanced data. And many of you are familiar because we also discussed uh, about this uh, a, a certain number of episodes ago. Uh, so feel free to uh, surf the uh, official website, datasensatom.com and search that episode where we spoke about bias, where we spoke about imbalanced data. We already mentioned some of these techniques. I'm just gonna repeat some of them here. Um, the first is, um, you know, copying the so-called minority class, um, multiplying the proportion uh, in the initial set. So if you have very rare positive samples, what you're essentially are doing there is blowing up the number of positive uh, samples. And so you have this, uh, um, you know, this, these copies of the minority class that are copied, you know, repeated over and over again in your training data set. And uh, this is one of the, you know, most widely used methods because you're not, uh, you know, removing information. In fact, you are adding information probably you are creating some form of, um, you know, bias uh, in the data due to the fact that you are blowing up some samples that should not be there. Uh, and essentially you are doing that probably not in the proportion of the natural phenomenon that you're observing, unless you have this information, of course. Uh, the second approach, it's actually kind of the opposite because it removes uh, some samples from the majority class uh, so that you can, you know, fill that gap between the minority and majority class. So you are, re you are reducing that difference somehow. And so what you are increasing and as an overall result, you are still increasing the proportion of the minority class, but you are doing so by removing samples from the majority class. And so um, while the, you know, data-wise, the, the, the outcome is exactly the same, uh, but from a machine learning perspective and also from a data perspective, you are removing information out of the system. Uh, and so maybe in these samples that you are removing, samples from the majority class that you are throwing away, probably there is some signal that your model would like to learn or you would like your model to learn. Uh, and that will never be the case because, of course, you just threw them away. Another problem is that um, this will usually has the tendency to increase the variance of the classifier. There are some statistical reasons why it's that the case, but uh, of course, I don't want to uh, drag into, into the scientific explanation of why that's, that's the case. But there are amazing uh, papers out there. I will report some in the show notes of this episode on the usual website. Now, there is another method, however, um, that is kind of something in between. And, uh, and this is, you know, in machine learning and data science, being in between something, it's always good. <laughs> Think about uh, ensembles. Uh, and in fact, that's exactly what we are talking about here. Uh, when you have so-called weak learners or learners that learn something from different aspects of the data, and then you put these models back together, somehow the result, the prediction that you perform is usually better than the prediction of the single model. And we have seen this many times with random forest, for example, and many other ensemble methods out there, even in from Bayesian statistics, of course, in which you have multiple iterations, not only, but multiple run of uh, different models against the, the same data or different model against different aspects or subsets of the data or a combination of the two. And so, and then what you do at the end is putting all these, you know, answers together so that you are kind of asking a crowd, a population of model and not just one model in particular. Because that model in particular can be biased, can be weak, uh, can be not sufficient to learn all the possible aspects of the phenomenon that you are trying to model. So what happens with random forest and how can random forest help uh, mitigating the problem of uh, super unbalanced data sets. 
Hey folks, if building software is your passion, you love ThoughtWorks Technology Podcast. It's a podcast for techies by techies. Their team of experienced technologists take a deep dive into a tech topic that's piqued their interest. It could be how machine learning is being used in astrophysics or maybe how to succeed at continuous delivery. They're always coming across fascinating ways technology is advancing and love to share what they learn. Whatever the topic, the discussions are always lively, informative, and opinionated. The team of co-hosts are experienced technologists from across ThoughtWorks and include ThoughtWorks CTO Dr. Rebecca Parsons and renowned writer and speaker Neil Ford. Each episode, the podcast features a guest or two to talk about their particular passion and areas of expertise. Past guests have included eminent technologists like Martin Fowler, Mark Richards, Dana Boyd, and many others. If you like this show, I think you should give ThoughtWorks Technology Podcast a try. To find out more, just search for ThoughtWorks Technology Podcast on your podcast platform of choice. And of course, make sure you subscribe. Well, there is a way, uh, in fact, there is an algorithm that has been proposed by Brayman. And Brayman is probably one of the most, it it should be one of the most well-known scientists uh, in the data science and machine learning community, because it's the guy who came with the idea of random forest back in the days. Uh, Again, I will uh, report probably his number one paper um, about random force, you know, introduction of random force to the community, to the scientific community. That's an amazing paper. Probably, you know, now you're not going to be amazed or surprised by these findings. But if you put that in perspective, and it was like, I don't know, 2004 or probably 2001, I don't recall. It was a long time ago now, so almost 20 years ago. And that model is still actually, you know, it's actually very modern in a sense, because even today uh, in production, we probably find more random forests than deep learning still. And uh, I don't see that disappearing as a trend because random forest is really, is a really, really powerful methodology. So how does random forest help with unbalanced data? Well, given the fact that by random forest, we need a bunch of trees, so-called decision trees that are cooperating and they are inferred by the da- from the data um, in an independent way, right? So that's what, what is random forest. It is a collection of trees and these trees, decision trees, are learning one particular aspect of the data for example, focusing on a subset of the features. Think about the columns if you have a tabular uh, data format as an input. And um, each tree, each decision tree, will learn one simple and weak aspect of that data. And uh, you have one, two, ten, a hundred, maybe thousands of these trees. And then you put their answers, their predictions together to you know, assess uh, the prediction of the entire record, right? Uh, by asking to each single tree, hey, what did you learn about this data? And what did you learn about this other part of the data? And what did you learn about this other piece of the data? And so on and so forth. And so every single model will answer, will give will give a prediction with respect to what that model knows about the data. So it's hyper-specialized in understanding that particular aspect of the data. That's what a random forest does, right? Now, there are several ways to build a random forest, which means to train each single decision tree. And uh, of course, uh, there are several flavors out there, and I really recommend you to um, read the uh, references that I will a- attach to the show notes of this episode, so that you can have kind, kind of a review of what are the flavors to build a random forest from scratch. But if you think and that your data is going to be, uh, let's say, very unbalanced, as is the case in this particular episode, well, then you can build that random forest in a, let's say, smarter way. Let's see how that goes. For each iteration in a random forest, uh, we draw a bootstrap sample from the minority class, right? So bootstrap sample means that I randomly select a uh, subset of samples from the minority class. And then, and then we also draw the same number of cases from the majority class so that we have a perfectly balanced training set, right? So we randomly choose 
we randomly bootstrap a sample from the minority class and we randomly draw the same number of cases from the majority class, right? Second step is inferring the decision tree. So we train a decision tree from that particular data. And uh, here, you know, it depends what algorithm you want to use to train that rec the, to train that particular decision tree. That's not the point. Whatever algorithm you use, the so-called optimal split, the split is the condition uh, on top of which that decision tree is going to branch, right? Well, that decision tree is inferred or is trained from a subset of uh, randomly selected variables. So instead of selecting the best, the optimal split by looking at all possible variables, we are just building the decision tree from a subset of these, um, of all the variables that are available, right? So first thing we have randomized the, in the input sample by selecting an always balanced training set, you know, same number of uh, from the minority class, same number of samples from the majority class. And then we said, okay, now we want to train, we want to build a decision tree. How do we create the split in each node of the tree? We look at all the variables? No, we look just at the subset of these variables. And we repeat this over and over again for hundreds and hundreds of trees. Now, of course, this depends on how big your data set is, how many features you have, and so on and so forth. So, so there, are, there are some parameters that you can still play. For example, how many random variables do you choose for the split? And how many, how big is your training set? So how many samples do you collect? That, of course, depends on how unbalanced your data is. So with this said, what happens at the end is that you will have a bunch of trees, let's say 100 trees, that are trained on a subset of the variables and on a subset of the of the training input that is perfectly balanced. Now what happens next is that you need to perform a prediction for a particular record. And so again, here you use the power of the ensemble. The ensemble methodology consists of asking each of these 100 trees, hey, what do you learn? What, did you, what can you tell me about this record? And each tree will respond to you with a prediction that is kind of, you know, the myopic vision of that particular uh, decision tree, right? And then, of course, what you do at the end, well, you ensemble the, all the predictions together, and then you decide, for example, in a probabilistic way, all right, if 60 trees have, have predicted that, for example, this is a, a positive sample, then I'm going to take it as a positive sample with probability 60%. So as you can see, you can even relate the answer of each, you know, of all the ensemble, of all the trees altogether, of the ensemble of the trees, uh, you can convert this information into probabilistic terms, which are much easier for human beings to understand. If I tell you, hey, there are 60% chances that this thing is positive or that this uh, patient is kind of sick. If I tell you, oh, I have 95% probability that this patient, by looking at these medical tests, there is a 95% probability that, uh, that he or she is sick. Why? Because there are 95 out of the 100 models, probably better, there are 90,000 <laughs> out of the 100,000 models, you really want to be sure about this thing, uh, that uh, you know, they all these models contributed to the prediction with the same answer, and therefore I will consider that ensemble prediction reliable. This is, of course, you will not find anything you know super fancy, novel, and uh, disruptive here. Um, but it is something that you definitely want to consider for your production data or production scenarios, because in reality, you know, in the real world. Uh, data are never perfectly balanced. You know, the world is not uh, an academic problem. The world is the world in which you always have unbalanced data, biased data, and all that things that we have discussed even in the previous episodes. Now, there is a problem here that whenever you use randomness in your model, you are creating some sort of, you know, you're adding a random component that is going to be impossible to remove. So you are removing the determinism 
out of the model, out of the methodology, in fact. So, uh, you know, if you repeat, uh, you know, this process over and over again, you're going to have probably different results, slightly different, but still different. So all the testing and all the, uh, you know, exact procedures that you would like to build on top will probably not work, uh, at least not under the traditional setting, because there is this random component that you cannot remove out of the equation. And that's why the ensemble helps you mitigating this or reducing this random component uh, by averaging. And that's, you know, a mechanism that is uh, statistically valid. Uh, and again, there are statistical theorems that tell you that that's actually the case. It's going to be too long and we probably need a couple of episodes to explain <laughs> why all this is statistically and from a mathematical perspective makes sense and it's actually sound under statistical terms, but it is. So just believe me or trust me <laughs> or read yourself the literature, um, but that's the case. Now, it's, it's a methodology. You add random components while you are building trees or models and then you average it out. Right now, be it a decision tree or be it whatever model you want to put as a weak learner underneath, the, the concept doesn't change at all. In fact, a decision tree is just one of the many possible weak learners that you can use for, uh, you know, under this framework. So, you know, the usual thing like iterate, randomize and mitigate randomization via ensembling. As I said, short and hopefully clear. I am really glad that you followed the show. Thank you very much for listening. Talk to you next time. You've been listening to Data Science at Home Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or Podbean to get new, fresh episodes. For more, please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, or visit our website at datascienceathome.com.